Welcome to the Surviving BPD Relationship Breakups podcast with your host, AJ Mahari. This podcast will give you an in-depth understanding of borderline personality disorder, whether you have it or a loved one, partner, ex, friend, adult child, or sibling of someone with borderline personality disorder. AJ Mahari is a counselor and trauma recovery coach who has 30 years experience working with those surviving borderline personality relationship breakups in all relationship types, healing from codependency, inner child healing, family of origin healing, and self-differentiation, narcissistic abuse recovery, and much more. Keeping it real to help you heal. Abuse is not love. You can find this podcast at ajmahari.ca where you can also purchase and book sessions with A.J. Mahari. Please also subscribe to A.J. Mahari's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash A.J. Mahari. In episode 44, season 2, at this point in time, the last episode of this podcast, was entitled Borderline Idealization Phase. It's not logical or targeted. And in that episode, if you haven't heard it, you might want to listen to it before listening to this one, or maybe not. But in the Borderline Idealization Phase, It's Not Logical or Targeted episode of this podcast, I talk about the initial phase. When the relationship begins, the initial idealization and what that's really all about. And in this episode, episode 45, season 2, of the Surviving BPD Relationship Breakup podcast, this is going to be all about the difference. So a, a deep dive into splitting in borderline personality disorder and what does that really mean? Because I think it's a misnomer and an inaccuracy And an oversimplification, this idea that splitting during the relationship, after the first evaluation split, after the end of the initial idealization phase and honeymoon phase, if people get a honeymoon phase with with a partner with BPD, after that, in the relationship, splitting, which is the major defense mechanism within borderline personality disorder, it's huge. It's ubiquitous within them. It is ongoing and without therapy will never change because it's part of the approach avoidance conflict, which is the push-pull, just to put it simply. So in this episode, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into splitting, as I said, because in relationships after the honeymoon phase is over and you've been devalued, then does this splitting cycle in BPD, as so many people describe it, does it really mean that when you're split to devaluation, that changes in whatever time it changes, however each person with BPD untreated gets back to not seeing you as all bad, but is that really, they go back to idealizing you again? That's what I'm going to talk about here, because I think... That's not what it is. And so this is a deep dive into the splitting cycle and borderline personality disorder. Again, splitting being the major defense mechanism of people with BPD. And I'm going to tell you some things in here that might sound, you might think, well, what? I've never heard that before. But with all the years I've had with working with people with BPD, people trying to survive the BPD relationship, heal from codependency, heal the trauma of the relationship, any other relational experiences that might have been similar. Healing trauma is what surviving the BPD relationship breakup is about in a multi-layered fashion. And I'm here to suggest that there just is no such thing as split to devaluation and then idealize again, split to devaluation and idealize again. There is something going on there in a splitting cycle, yes, And so that's what I'm going to get into in this podcast episode. Idealization and devaluation are defense mechanisms. And they help people with BPD. What is this defense mechanism defending? Well, people with BPD and treat are living through the false self. And so the defense 
is to protect and help people with BPD to manage anxiety as well as what's happening for them emotionally, internally, to, to try to manage, which ends up really looking like, quote, controlling, unquote, internal or external stress, stressors, triggers to emotional dysregulation, which isn't anybody else's fault, by the way. So this is a, a unconscious protection system. Is there this constant shifting back between idealization and devaluation known as splitting? Splitting being, again, the major defense in borderline personality. Starts really, can start in infancy, starts really at a young age. It, of course, looks quite different at that stage of life. But that's where it really begins for, for most who go on to be diagnosed with BPD or who could be diagnosed with BPD. So this splitting signifies is emblematic of a manifestation of a disturbance in both the way that people with BPD are thinking and their attempts at emotion regulation. And it reflects challenges in maintaining an integrated view of the good and the bad in a person under stress. And let me just expand that to say, period. Because people with BPD are dichotomous thinkers and majorly overwhelmed with emotions and feelings and don't understand where they're coming from because they're not really coming from the here and now with you, the partner or the ex, the person who likely has codependency. But again, you're not responsible for what the person with BPD does or how they behave and what they say and how they project out things that they're feeling and doing onto you. So it's often said in a description of borderline personality that idealization often alternates with evaluation. So a person with BPD may shift from great admiration for a loved one referred to as and so called to be as if idealization to intense anger toward or and or dislike of that same loved one maybe like minutes later devaluation why does that happen like that internal triggers or triggers that that then trigger the person with bpd to dysregulated emotion however i think that the cycle of idealization and devaluation in the course of relationships with many, many people with BPD, so maybe not all. I think it's a bit of a misnomer because more than the splitting cycle involves obviously splitting to devaluation and a lot of difficulty, rage, silent treatment, on-off relationships, getting ghosted, being discarded, or if the relationship is still continuing and there's been a devaluation, or many, then it doesn't mean that when the devaluation aspect period of the cycle in splitting, it's not really the people with BPD, most, many don't, some might, that they don't really come back to idealization again, to re-idealizing you. They come back to a base mood. And this base mood, or each base mood after devaluation, is really just coming back to a place that is base because it ceases to be highly dysregulated emotion and emotion dysregulation that is what pushes, causes, and drives seeing you in a devaluation split as all negative, quote, painted to black, unquote, wherein they might feel some positive towards you, and it can be very inconsistent. So I think it's a bit of a misnomer of a description that people with BPD are always, you know, there's a split to devaluation to push, then there's the pull, which is like an idealization again, a real idealization. No, it's usually a return to a base mode that then sees the ceasing of the experience of the devaluation. So it's not really clearly re-idealization. Nothing has really changed for the person with untreated BPD. Nothing is really going to be different. And nothing about the base mood and now seeing you in a more positive light, or even if we call it all good, seeing you as only all good again, that doesn't mean that that's going to last. It's inconsistent. It's transient to the next evaluation. This is why I believe it isn't, quote, idealization 
unquote. It's coming back to a base mood, then devaluation split, then base mood, because the emotions that dysregulate with triggers that create the devaluation cycle, there's a time of that, whatever that might be in each person with BPD's patterns, and then the emotions calm down, whether they've raged, whether they've given you the silent treatment, whether they've ghosted on and off for a few days at a time, or they tell you they might ghost, and then if you get a hold of them, they might say, well, I just need three days or I need three weeks, which sometimes is going to lead to a discard. But often there are many people with BPD where they need this time. Those dysregulated emotions calm down. They come back to a base mood place, which is the cessation of devaluation. But it is not starting over again with idealization or re-idealization, even though the cessation of devaluation brings the person with BPD back to the base place of, oh, you're all good now because they're not in the dysregulated emotion, etc. of what drives devaluation. So the push-pull is a good way to describe it, but to say that in the push is the valuation, yes. But to say in the pull is all is going back to idealization, no. For so many people with BPS, it's not true. It's coming back to base mood. It's not going any further than that. It's not the same thing as the original, the first, the meeting the person, the idealization phase slash honeymoon phase that not everybody gets with a person with BPD, by the way. So this splitting causes a lot of damage to interpersonal relationships, to people trying to love untreated people with BPD. So like, what is idealization? Well, it is a psychological or mental process of attributing overly positive qualities to another person or thing. It's a way of coping with anxiety in which an object or person of ambivalence is viewed as perfect or having exaggerated positive qualities. So can I just underscore for you in the definition of idealization during a relationship, these, these cycles, not the uh, you know initial idealization phase, that that process of attributing overly positive qualities to another person doesn't necessarily mean within relationships that that's idealization, that that's re-idealization. It is coming back to base mood and an, and a no long, and them no longer being so emotionally overwhelmed, emotionally dysregulated, but it doesn't mean that it rises to re-idealization. And idealization reduces anxiety by protecting the person with BVD from emotional conflicts that might emerge in a relationship. And so they they have an inability to deal with the fear of abandonment as well as uh, uh, the fear of engulfment and engulfment anxiety and abandonment anxiety. And rather than deal with the fear uh, that they're not really sure why they have it, but they feel it often, that it, the fear that the other person isn't perfect or that the relationship might not work out, so fear of abandonment versus oh, this person is just like, I can't even breathe. I got to get away from this person because they're trying to control me. And I'm going to cease to exist as if people with BPD even know who they are or have a self to exist from in that regard because it's the false self. So then the engulfment at the other end, which is the push away, is when they're feeling like they're being controlled and subsumed by you, which isn't anything that you're doing Why they feel that way. So the idealization allows them to keep the fantasy of perfection intact, only it's never really intact once the initial idealization phase hits the first snag of the first evaluation. So this is what I'm putting forward, that it's not really. Splitting is, so in the push away, it is that the entire... Like they entirely attribute nothing but negative attributes to you. 
Then they come back to base mood, maybe in, you know, hours or days or whatever it takes for each person with BPD untreated especially. Then when they get back to base mood, they might again attribute more positive qualities to you. So this is almost like, not exactly like, but it's cognitive dissonance because they can't hold the positive and the negative about somebody in balance like by being in the middle of the paradox of the fact that we're not all all good ever really or perfect and we're not all all bad usually right so I don't think that this cycle of splitting it's really accurate to say that that most people with BPD are coming back to idealizing you again no they're coming back to base mood and they're going to maybe have some more positive feelings again until something triggers them again and then they feel all these feelings and they don't know why these are the unconscious repetition compulsion cycles of re-experiencing things from their past when they are triggered to emotional dysregulation which can at times include age regression and levels of dissociation but it doesn't always every single time and not everybody with BPD is going to be having the same experience around that So it's really accurate to say that people with BPD do not experience in any emotional way or relational way paradox. Thus you have splitting, but I would argue that or advocate for people to understand that you're not really being re-idealized, idealized after devalued. They're coming back to a base mood. They're open to a little bit more positivity because now they're on that side of the fence, so to speak, but only until they're not again, which could be in a matter of minutes or hours or a day or, you know, it's different for everybody. When they come back to a positive, like to a base mood where they can experience you as all good again, after the all bad, they can feel intense closeness towards you and place you on a pedestal. Well, I don't think they place, this is the explanation, but they don't really place you on a pedestal every single time, maybe to some degree. But I I would suggest that that's not re-idealization. It is the young childlike emotional presentation of a person with BPD coming back to seeing you in a positive light with all of the fear and trepidation and stress that that really causes them based on their past. So they put, they, they might put you back on a sort of pedestal. It won't be as high a pedestal as the initial idealization phase in the beginning of relationships. And then that can quickly and unpredictably change to intense anger toward the person, really negative feelings, splitting again, back to devaluation. And so what exactly is devaluation? Well, according to psychiatry and psychology, devaluation is a defense mechanism that is just the opposite of idealization. It is employed or manifested when a person characterizes themselves or someone else or another person as completely flawed, worthless, or having exaggerated negative qualities. This happens when people with BPD are triggered to emotional dysregulation and the world of hurt and all the emotions that are flooding them internally that are from the past and they don't realize that so they're going to act as if it's happening in the here and now. That's why so many partners or people that are exes of those with BPD now, you're sitting there thinking about things like, we were just sitting there watching a movie, everything was fine and all of a sudden they were just like ripping me apart. Devaluation. Where'd that come from? Nothing happened. I don't understand. Well, it often, it, it more often than not, totally does happen internally when the person with BPD is triggered because their triggers are internal. It's not like you trigger them because you're five minutes late. You trigger them because this. No, if, if they're triggered because you're five minutes late, that's their fear of abandonment. That has nothing to do with you being five minutes late. And if they're triggered because you didn't text right away in response to their text, same thing. Then let's say you texted them a whole lot one day because you were really concerned about them. Then they might get into engulfment anxiety or fear of engulfment, fear of being controlled. Like you just won't leave them alone. Like you just leave me alone. Like what are you, what are you texting me every 10 minutes for? 
and then that would lead to a devaluation. And people with BPD and Trina often feel like they're flawed, worthless, and just negative qualities, like there's nothing good about them. That's the core shame wound. And also what people with BPD do on the opposite side of that, again, dichotomy, no paradox, no middle, is the overcompensatory defensive strategies to feel better that I've talked about where they might all of a sudden act like they're all that or they know a lot more, or you might think, well, this person has to be a narcissist because, look, now they think they're just great. But it's overcompensatory defense against the how how worthless and how negative they feel and the self-hatred that they have inside without this actual formed and, and developed identity of a self. So the false self is what's in play here in people with BPD untreated. So it's often described on the internet, idealization can quickly turn into devaluation, but it's really base mood. It's not, it's not idealization anymore. It's some positive feelings to you being in the all good side of things, but not necessarily putting you really high on a pedestal like they did in the beginning that can quickly turn to devaluation because there's often, there is no middle ground for untreated people with BPD. So the person with BPD feeling challenged, threatened, or disappointed, or fearing abandonment, or fearing engulfment, which they're not aware of in any given situation or experience, then with their inability to cope with the stress of ambivalence, the devaluing function functions to minimize the anxiety caused by ambiguity. So it is almost like a kind of upside-down inverted uh, version of cognitive dissonance that people suffer probably in these relationships but after the BPD relationship breakup because people with BPD in a different way than what cognitive dissonance actually means, well, they're having cognitive dissonance but more to the point probably emotional dissonance because they can't ever, without a lot of substantial treatment, see a good quality in you when they're when they're experiencing the devaluation and the the emotional dysregulation and they're triggered and so then they're seeing you as all bad and again experiencing you as all bad object other representation of bad parent wounding parent they just can't hold one good thing about you at the same time as they've gone to everything is bad about you. So these cycles, I think, are explained in a way that isn't the most helpful way to understand them because devaluation is devaluation and it's all negative, it's all bad. You get, quote, painted all black, unquote. But the idealization, it is not idealization through the course of a relationship. Again, it is just coming back to base mood and then seeing you in a more positive light. And that is the split. But but I would continue to assert it's not really re-idealization. And I've had so many clients describe it to me in a way that suggests it's not. The valuation happens and then they come back to a base place, but it's not really re-idealization, even though they're seeing you as more positive again. They just don't get that into the positivity because they're going to more or less pretty quickly, whatever that means for each person with BPD, be back into the devaluation push away because every time you get close with them, then they get engulfed. Fear of engulfment, engulfment anxiety, they must push away because they cannot manage. Everything is, yes, it's either positive, but not necessarily all great good, like the, the original idealization phase and then it, or it's all negative and horrible. And this is how, they feel about themselves as well. It's how they live their own lives, even if they, if they happen to be on their own, if they're not in a relationship. And it's a self-protective defense mechanism that aims to help people with BPD protect themselves from getting hurt in relationships. But it's really a self-sabotaging, unconscious self-sabotaging, self-defeating, kind of like maladaptive. It's a defense that's now way maladaptive. It does it destroys relationships. It doesn't really help people with BPD to protect themselves 
within the relationship, it might to some degree, but it's also relationship destroying among other things that people with BPD do and say, how they treat you. So when people with BPD label people as, quote, good, unquote, they're able to engage in relationships despite the emotional risks. But I would say, hey, they all do that a little bit differently. They all do that to different measure, measurement of manifestation of the positive. It's not necessarily re-idealization. And then if they feel threatened, they will quickly discard the individual or the relationship by labeling everything is all bad. And like most defense mechanisms that are, you know, helpful in childhood, people have to endure a lot of adverse experience in childhood that end up being diagnosed with BPD or that could be. And so they're me- th- these defense mechanisms that help them survive in childhood are now maladaptive in adulthood, to say the very least. So like most defense mechanisms, someone with BPD may not be aware they're engaging in this dichotomous experience of someone that they're trying to relate to because they don't really attach to you if they're untreated and they don't really know how to love. How can you love somebody else if you don't have a self yourself? This is what I'm always talking about when, you know, really taking a deep dive into the realm of what people with BPD are really experiencing internally that you may or may not know is going on for them a much more of the time of each day than they might be manifest, manifesting that to you. And splitting is an unconscious way to protect themselves from stress, perceived or actual. So, and triggers realiven adverse experience and stressors from the past that are, are not in the consciousness, conscious awareness of people with untreated BPD. So splitting reflects the challenges associated with maintaining, well, trying to get to an integrated view that people with BPD untreated can't get to, whether under stress or not. So some researchers suggest that some of the difficulty is rooted in the way the brain, particularly the amygdala and prefrontal lobe, activates in these experiences for people with BPD. But that Again, I don't know if it's been proven, but then there's the HPA access, which involves the amygdala and the four Fs, the freeze, pawn, flight, fight. And what have they been through in their childhood? And what is their style? Is it freeze? Is it fawn? Is it fight, flight? Splitting, I just want to say again, I really, you know, think about it in your own experience with somebody with BPD untreated, but it just isn't idealization to devaluation, from devaluation to idealization. It's devaluation, you're all bad, based on internal stressors and re-experiencing of trigger dysregulated emotion that people with BPD have no conscious awareness of where that's coming from. So they think it's you in the here and now when it isn't you in the here and now. And then they get back to a base mood where they can feel and see good attributes in you again. That's not necessarily re-idealization. And so now that I have talked about that, which I hope you find helpful or you might not totally agree with because it's stated that these splitting cycles with people with BPD are devaluation, idealization, devaluation, which, which I'm really here to say, no, not really. It's definitely devaluation and you're all bad. And then you seem to be all good again. But I just want to make it clear. That is not the same as re-idealizing you. Like it's got nothing to do with how you were idealized in the beginning of the relationship. And that that idealization doesn't even mean that you're being seen and heard for who you are at all. It's just... They are experiencing you as object other good parent never had. And so that feels good. And when they feel good, then you are good. And when they feel bad, stressed, emotion dysregulated, then you're bad. Because they don't know the difference between self and other. So what they feel, they really believe you are causing them to feel. Which is a misnomer, inaccurate and very projective of people with BPD. 
So I did do, <clears throat> there is a, a podcast episode up here on the podcast that um, was a video I did also on my YouTube channel. And it was called Borderline Idealization Phase, meaning the initial idealization when you meet them. It's not logical or targeted. And then from that, there's been a couple of really interesting comments. And that video in itself, oh, I'm sorry, the, the podcast episode here too, was a response of mine to someone else commenting, trying to over logic and add in many things that they were theorizing could be also part of the initial borderline idealization phase, which really I don't think so. So a commenter to the video, which you will, if you just follow the podcast, you will have heard the podcast episode, hopefully, borderline idealization phase, it's not logical or targeted. So on my YouTube channel, someone commented, I think I tend to get confused because I feel like or felt like the idealization devaluation was constant through the relationship. So I didn't feel like it was a certain phase. But see, there, there's, there is confusion there for this person because there is the idealization phase without a doubt in the beginning of the relationship and what that actually means and is all about. And it's not what a lot of people think, but it feels great. And it's, you know, until it isn't. And then people start to realize, wow, something's going on here, etc. So they thought it was just, oh, so they're saying they thought it was constant through the relationship, which is true. It is, uh, except I'm saying, I don't really believe it's, you know, re-idealization. And so they didn't think it was a certain phase. Well, there's two different aspects there, right? There's the idealization phase that people with BPD are in when they meet you and who you think they are when they're mirroring you and people pleasing you through the borderline codependency. And yeah, they're really reflecting everything back to you and just trying. And, and, and it's not something they do target with it, like in a way that targets you. It's not something they do consciously on purpose. This person says, but now I realize that there is definitely definitely was a honeymoon phase between both of us. I think the splitting is more what I thought was idealization. And then they said devaluation. So as if like back and forth, back and forth, I guess they mean, I don't know. But the splitting, that is essentially what splitting is defined as. But again, I'm asserting going a little more in depth into this to delineate and try to explain it I hope even in a more accurate way, again, that the splitting phase that goes on throughout, you know, the defense mechanism of splitting, the all good, the all bad, is devaluing you when you're put in the all bad. But it is not re-idealization when you're in the all good. It is coming back to base mode. It is simply getting the borderline, getting out of devaluation. It's no more than that. And the commenter continues, and in a way, it's, it's, one, it's on a small scale, but I guess the difference is that the splitting occurs during the phase of the relationship where it's possible and normal for them to split. The splitting occurs except for in the idealization phase of the beginning and the honeymoon phase. The splitting is occurring sometimes even more than you know because they don't always manifest it externally every single time they go through it. It is a major defense mechanism in borderline personality that helped them survive in childhood that has become maladaptive in any adult relationship because the person with BPD is not emotionally, they have not emotionally adulted at all. And the commenter continues that the person that they were with with BPD would be randomly sitting with them and then start accusing them and having all these thoughts, etc., and be really mean to them and not trust this person. It wouldn't trust them and say horrible things, but then he would be extremely apologetic and, as they put it, obsessed and love me again. Well, that's not love. Okay, it's not love. Love is something that is, healthy love is consistent and congruent. 
It doesn't come and go. It's not given to you and then taken away. Given and then you're devalued and you're horrible and you're awful. It's not healthy love at all. But that's what this person felt. And then they thought that the person with their partner with BPD had so much faith in them again. This also isn't true. Not really. It may seem like that. So then they said, so they believe that splitting really is just short time fragments of devaluation and then idealization again. No, because actually the devaluation isn't really short term necessarily and isn't fragments of anything in particular, aside from the fact that people with BPD have a child ego state that is totally fragmented off at the arrested emotional development point before or by the age of two. And then they don't idealize again. They come back to a base mood. They get out of, out of all the negative perceptions, misperceptions, etc. And then they can be a little more positive until they can't again. And then the communists had come to find out that all the things he used to accuse me of when he was splitting were things he was guilty of himself in the relationship, but I didn't know until the end. Well, yes, because borderline devaluation starts internally with triggers and emotional dysregulation and sometimes age regression and sometimes degrees of dissociation. It's a re-experiencing of past adverse experience that the person with BPD doesn't is not consciously aware of and then when they feel that bad and they feel that much and they don't know how to cope with it, they shoot it out at you projectively and they're telling you that you're doing to them, like somehow you must be causing how they feel and that you're doing to them what in fact they're going to do to you because they're trying to get rid of all this anxiety and pain and discomfort and in some cases terror inside that they feel when they're triggered. And another commenter said, I kind of view to the, um, well, it's a video on my channel, but uh, to, in the podcast episode, borderline idealization phase, it's not logical or targeted. Another commenter said, I kind of view the idealization phase as a projection of the BPD person's good quality, self-love, courage, strength, and most of all, personal power. Absolutely incorrect. Because they don't know who they are. They don't have a stable sense of identity. They have an arrested, arrested emotional self. They have lost the self. There has been, as Melanie Klein in Object Relations Theory says, as I quote often, there's been, quote, the psychological death of the otherwise burgeoning authentic self, unquote. That's pretty clear. And when that child ego state fragments off and is gone and the self has emotionally arrested the false self rises up so the people with bpd don't have i'm not saying they don't have any good qualities but they don't have this immense amount of good and consistent qualities positive consistent qualities they don't have self-love they don't even have a self they don't know who they are whether they have courage or not in emotional interpersonal relating uh no it's just not an issue and, and nor is strength at that point. And it's not about their personal power at all because they don't have any. And then this commenter continued, they learned as a baby that if the, it wasn't safe to own those things. So now their coping mechanism is to project those things out onto an object or another person. Um, yeah, except for it's not that they learned as a baby that it was, yeah, it wasn't safe. but But not that it wasn't safe to own the qualities like their good qualities, self-love, courage, strength, and personal power. Infants don't have any of that going on. And people who go on to you know, be diagnosed with BPD or maybe could be, they don't have those qualities intact because the self has collapsed. The self has been emotionally arrested. They do not continue to emotionally develop from that arrested development and woundedness by or before the age of two. And then the commenter says it has nothing to do with the other person and it's not love. Very true. 
And the fact that they are doing this proves that they don't actually have any connection to the other person at all. This is also very true. Because you represent to the person with BPD in any relationship type, object other parent representation. And a good parent never had when they feel positive about you. And a bad or wounding parent when they are devaluing you. It's not about you at all. That's the problem. You're in a relationship. You're trying to love them. You're trying to help them. You're trying to fix them. You're trying to rescue them. You're trying to get them to go to therapy. You're loving them. You're trying to be kind. That's what most people with codependency are doing all of this with no reciprocation. And that's a big piece, right? No mutuality. And then when you have a feeling or you have a need, where does the borderline go? Because they don't hear you. They don't see you. They're much too busy with their own internal H-E double hockey sticks from their early childhood. And this is why they're so, quote, self-focused, unquote. It's not totally dissimilar to the narcissist, but it's not exactly the same thing either. Because people with BPD's um, kind of base place and how they feel about themselves, again, not necessarily consciously known to them, is that they feel worthless, they feel awful, they feel like everybody's just going to throw them away, like they're not worthy of anything. And that's what's going on inside of most people with BPD untreated or who could be diagnosed. And the other thing is narcissists do something different with that. They turn everything into how great they are. Borderlines can only do that in a transient kind of like for a period of time, short period of time, over compensatory strategy to try to feel better. It is in Eric Burns' transactional analysis model, a psychodynamic modality, it is the four life positions, and two in particular. When the borderline feels, as they usually do, untreated, not okay, then they try to make you, not consciously, but they need for you to feel unokay so they can feel okay. So it's this, I'm not okay, you're okay, so I have to make you unokay so I can be okay. Because it's that either or, it's that black and white, it's that essential split again. And it, it's not conscious though, they're not actually thinking what I just said. And the commenter continues, uh, the reason they have no self is because they have coping mechanisms like this one to split off and project literally every sense of themselves onto someone else. No, incorrect. They don't have a self. So the reason they have no self, they have no self. Arrested emotional development, adverse experience, too many unmet needs, etc. in very early childhood, infancy to toddlerhood, before or by the age of two. So they don't have, this is a coping mechanism, yes, maladaptive in adulthood, but they don't have any sense of self to project onto other. That's not what's happening. And the commenter continues, now why it goes from idealization to devaluation is something I don't deeply understand, but I see that it allows them to project everything that is split from the, quote, good to eventually the, quote, bad, so that they never have to feel any of that about themselves. Well, they're feeling that almost all the time, but they're not feeling it about themselves. There's no container of self. There's no self. There's a false self. So they're going to project out everything they feel onto the closest person. And I've tried to explain this in many different um, videos and whatnot on the YouTube channel. The idea that they're projecting this out because they never have to feel, so they never have to feel that about themselves? Well, in a way, yes, they are trying to evacuate their emotions. They're trying to externalize their emotions. The quiet borderline might internalize it more, go away, and suffer in a different way, and then you don't know what's going on, and you wonder what you did wrong, and it doesn't have anything to do with you. But basically, they don't feel these things. They feel tons but they're not aware of what they're feeling, which is the key thing. And then, you know, someone else commented on another another video, which this will fit here too. 
that it was actually a video I did called Punishment and Revenge and Borderline Personality Disorder. I think it's like 14 years ago I did that video. And this commenter said, well, being right helps me avoid shame. So isn't that interesting? Because I think this is a person maybe talking from the BPD perspective. But you see, people with BPD are always right fighting. And I do have a couple of videos on right fighting. And I will maybe do a podcast episode on right fighting to make that more clear. And the concept, by the way, of right fighting, is, I think, was put forth maybe by others. But I'm relying on the information of the learned leading professional in object relations theory and borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder, the late, great Dr. James F. Masterson. So yes, the person says, well, being right helps me avoid shame. This is true. But people with BPD are fooling themselves in that they think they are right. And one of the mechanisms or the reasons for that can be because they are trying to get out of the feelings of shame and not go down that rabbit hole, so to speak. And then they, they continue the deep, deep shame of being imperfect and less than human that is a result of my mother's projections onto me as a child. This happens. You know, people with a borderline mother are five times more likely to end up with BPD themselves, but I don't believe that that's a genetic process. Whether there's any genetics involved, they still haven't proven. But that is the intergenerational nature of this failure to nurture. And the person with BPD, I mean, the, the child with a sensitive temperament meeting with an invalidating environment. And then this commenter continues, I used to involve other people in this cycle of dysregulation, but now it has become mostly an internal struggle. What's happening is that if I can come up with any logical argument as to why I'm wrong or at fault, I immediately assume it's correct and spiral into shame. This is a very good explanation of a big part of what's happening internally for people with BPD. Toxic superego that is still trying to protect me. Well, but it grew out of control because of shame projections I was receiving had nothing to do with me, right? Injunctions and interjects from the adverse experience, uh, wounding, injuring parent that are taken in by the child internally. This is true for codependence. This is true for people with BPD, but it doesn't have, it doesn't go to the same depth. It doesn't create the same entire uh, emotional uh, situation for people with codependency that it does for people with BPD. And the toxic superego at that point is really an out-of-control false self, trying to protect, protect, protect at all costs almost all the time. So the person said it grew out of control because of the shame projections. Yep, that had nothing to do with them. This happens to people in their childhoods. Uh, whether Whether a person has codependency or has BPD. That would be another overlap, but it doesn't make them the same. Those, those interjects, injunctions that this person took on from, you know, a, a wounding parent, mother, uh, that had nothing to do with me, it went on to say, whether I was right or wrong, my goodness, or it, it, yeah, would equal whether she was, this person was good or bad as a child. This is also, as this person explains it, I think it resonates with what I said about how very young splitting starts in people who are going to go on to be diagnosed or not diagnosed, but have BPD. And the commenter continues, a a person obviously with BPD who's very aware, there is nothing inherently shameful about being wrong or making mistakes. Grace is the answer. Giving myself the gift of grace is more valuable than being right. And actually, what this commenter has just said there, and I don't know if they're in therapy or where they're at, but that is the challenge. One of the key core challenges for people with BPD is how to stop right fighting and realize that it's not all about right versus wrong. Because if they don't right fight, then they feel wrong, then they feel shame, then they feel worthless, etc. 
And so finding grace as an answer, giving someone, realizing that, give, as this person said, giving myself the gift of grace is more valuable than being right. Yes, yes, because that is starting to soothe and to care and be aware of self, whether self is known yet or, or not, wherever this person might be or whatever amount of therapy they may or may not have had. I don't know. So I'm going to do more on this right fighting and, and hopefully that will explain things because one of the biggest obstacles to why people with BP don't get into treatment, won't choose it, is the right fighting to keep out the shame and the re-experiencing of all this emotional dysregulation that they re-experience often anyways, but that they can't cope with. They have no tools in the basket to cope with because often, 87% of the time, people with BPD have a cluster B parent, mother or both parents. And so they don't learn. And this is something that, you know, how they act, how they behave, what they say, how they treat other people, but not this person, as they say, they're keeping their struggle internally and not, you know, projecting it out onto others now, which is excellent for this person, but still they're struggling inside. And the thing about that is that, yes, the inherent struggles that are going on inside people with BPD due to what's happened to them that they didn't ask for, due to, you know, this nurture versus nature argument. Well, a big component of this, if they ever prove anything to do with uh, genetics, which they may or may not, but we all know that adverse experience affects the brain, right? The developing brain, and it affects people's brains in adulthood if you have a really adverse experience that you need to heal and recover from. So again, idealization... The splitting cycles within BPD in relationships, it's not really, it's called, you know, it's push-pull. It's the approach avoidance conflict, and it's referred to as idealization to devaluation split. But I'm here to suggest to you it's devaluation split and a whole lot's going on there, and then it's coming back to base mode and not re-idealizing you at all. And I think that's important that people understand that because that's, if they could, if people at BP Entry could really re-idealize you, they would be further ahead, if you know what I mean. They would be able to relate a little bit better. They would have more awareness of the difference between, quote, idealization, unquote, and devaluation. Because really what's happening in the relationship cycles they're coming back to base mood only. They're not putting you back on a pedestal. They're not seeing you as they saw you in the initial idealization phase. So I think a lot of what's communicated about this, was, which is traditionally explained this way forever, but I share this with you as somebody who was uh, had the experience of those splitting cycles in my life, like as a child. And up until I was about 29 or so, and I had healed and recovered after 15 years worth of therapy. So the point is, I'm trying to give you the inside scoop as somebody who went through this and has a lot of awareness about what that struggle was like. I can remember and recall from way back, like over 40 years ago. And I'm not saying just because of what I experienced internally, that that means that there is no you know idealization after every split in the relationship because maybe for some people with BPD it could be like that but i'm suggesting for a lot of people it isn't so it's it's a deeper and a less sort of idyllic if you will coming back to idealize again no not really because once that initial devaluation from the initial idealization phase happens, they're never going to see you as good as they did in the beginning. And that was where they were mirroring you, etc. Now there's too much separation in the push-pull approach avoidance conflict. So maybe this sounds like mincing words, but people need to really understand that 
this is awful to continue to go through on the other side of somebody with BPD, no matter how much you love them, because whether they're actually coming back to an idealization after the split to devaluation, which again, I argue they really aren't, they're coming back to base mode and then seeing you more positively to varying degrees. But the thing is, this is not a way to live. This is what is so wounding and so injurious to people that are partners or in other relationship types with people with BPD untreated. And I don't say this to um, stigmatize or speak really ill of people with BPD. I'm just trying to lay it out there for people who are in these relationships, the on, off again, the ghosting, etc., and people who continue to still want these people in their lives or, you know, different relationship types, different dynamics, but a significant other that gets ghosted and discarded has gone through many of these, you know, good, bad cycles, let's just say, the splitting, but the good, the bad, the push, the pull, which is their approach avoidance conflict, which is always, you know, when they get too close, anxiety, they have engulfment anxiety and fear of engulfment. They feel control, they got to push you away. It's not really about you. And then they have so much anxiety inside and then some and more other feelings and they don't know why and they don't know how to handle it or cope with it without therapy. So then the thing is when you're close, it's great, right? And then they push you away and often that's a ghosting and it could be a pattern of ghosting to come back. And then after that, you know, the devaluation is brutal, confusing, and people lose themselves to it. These relationships, as I've said, and I mean all respect to people with BPD who are really suffering, they just can't function in any healthy, reasonable, consistent, congruent way in adult relationships. They do not love. They do not accept your love. They don't trust you. They don't know themselves. These relationships are the setup is the initial idealization phase where they're mirroring you and people pleasing you and seeking identity through you, but not your identity. And then there's a lack of object constancy. So the object constancy gets parked with you. And then it's all about them trying to feel like kind of real and also trying to feel safe. And no other person can provide safety to somebody with BPD who's been so gone through so much already in childhood, fear, terror, uh, all kinds of things that happen. And so it's not the same thing as, you know, when you have your own child and if you're healthier and you can nurture a child and you can mold and help a child develop in a healthier way, but you can't take a person with BPD, even at the age of 15 or 17 or 20 or 25 or whenever you're dating them or whatever or you're in a relationship can't take that person with all that's already happened to them that is what bpd really is this relational disorder this lack of self loss of self inability to connect inability to take in love inability to love and attach the idealization phase and when you meet the person that you really think they are is largely an unconscious meeting in the middle of a fantasy that the borderline and the codependent are not aware of consciously at all. And it is the beginning of the end of the relationship because these relationships are not possible. They are impossible. And that's what people with codependency have to keep working to understand and get into your own healing and recovery process around that because we're not, I'm not trying to vilify people with BPD at all, but they need treatment so they can find themselves, so they can heal, so they can recover. It's a lot of work. And as Dr. John Gunderson says, this is not a quote from A.J. Mahari. Dr. John Gunderson says, and particularly in Transference Focused Psychotherapy, which Dr. John Gunderson and Dr. Frank Yeomans pioneered, which is an amazing therapy for people with BPD, it really helps people heal and recover from BPD. Dr. John Gunderson said it takes on average for people with BPD in their treatment modality, which I believe is the best one out there for BPD, bar none, for true recovery, it takes 8 to 16 years. 
So that's not a quote from A.J. Mahari. That's a quote from Dr. John Gunderson. And I would imagine that Dr. Frank Yeomans would support that as well. So just so you know where that information is coming from, the same as the object relations approach I take to understanding and explaining BPD, hopefully in a more in-depth way, in a more understandable way for you, because it is the pioneering work of like Dr. James F. Masterson. And I mean, so many names I can't mention, but Dr. John Gunderson, Dr. Frank Gilman's, and so many others. So this is not all coming from little old me. I didn't pioneer all this stuff. I just learned it, um, lived it, and healed and recovered. And then I can go back and forth and think, well, okay, I know what this is like internally. I remember, right? And then that doesn't mean everything that I experienced the way I experienced because I didn't really have full-blown BPD. I wasn't assessed. I didn't have it severely. There's a difference. But then there are other people out there that don't have it as severely as maybe the majority of people who have BPD really do. But what do you need to hear today if you're a person who loves somebody with BPD in any relationship type, but especially if you're a significant other? You need to know that you are in a codependent denial place with false hope of really caring about somebody who deserves to be cared about, but who's going to wound you unendingly in trying to continue a relationship. And they can't start treatment in the middle of the relationship and make and save the relationship. So this effort to tell them they have BPD, this effort to... Get them into therapy. It's not going to save your relationship. People with codependency have to look at why. Not not what the people with BPD do or anything. You're not, you're not at fault for that. You're not to blame for that. What your responsibility is right now, which is really painful and difficult without a doubt, and I'm out here to work with you if I resonate with you on this, is people with codependency, partners, people in other relationship types with people with BPD, untreated. You need to look at what you need. You need to look at how you can't save this person. You can't rescue this person. You can't make them change. You're not going to be able to make it okay. And then that is the point where people avoid and deny and have false hope because that's when people with codependency are understandably to a degree, try, you're trying to stay out of your own pain because you have pain not only from this relationship or, or your relationship or your BPD relationship breakup that you're trying to survive, but you have pain from your childhood that this, but dysfunctional family of origin and the wounded inner child. And I'm going to have a lot more coming on this. And I'm really pleased to announce that I'm going to be offering sessions for those who would like to do some of this inner child healing or just basically work on the adverse experience from the relationship or relationships you've had with cluster bees and from what wounded you in childhood, why you have codependency and what that really means. I will be offering brain spotting sessions as well as people that want to start off with just, you know, kind of the talk, explore kind of um, support in sessions to understand more. People that like to fire endless questions at me about BPD, which is fine. You know, that's what I'm there to help people with, specifically when they tell me the details of their own personal relationships, right? What they've really experienced. And I'm, I'm not here to tell anybody what to do, but I am here to keep it real, to help you heal. And so the blunt thing I have to say, which I say with a lot of compassion, but it is honest and it is true. And you might not want to hear it and you might not want to know it. You need to take care of yourself. You can't rescue or save or fix any untreated borderline. You just can't do it. You're losing yourself trying to do it. You're replicating things from your own childhood, which doesn't... Many people with codependency have a cluster B parent or two, but many don't. So it's not the exact same thing. But people with codependency are reenacting unconsciously things from their childhood in these toxic relational dynamics as well. So I hope that you found this at least interesting, thought-provoking. Whether you agree or disagree, whether you want to hear it or not right now, these relationships are not meant to last. 
they cannot work. People with BPD need to get into the, they do better in treatment usually than when they're not in relationships. They need to go and get significant treatment over the course of a lot of years, as Dr. John Gunderson says. And you, as a codependent, you might not agree, but because not everybody with codependency, it doesn't mean you have everything that codependency can mean. You might have it moderately, you might have it significantly, or you might have it severely. But the point is, you need to understand why you confuse love, being hurt, whether or not the person with BPD intends that. And that's, that's not a healthy, workable relationship. So being in a relationship with somebody with untreated BPD, which nobody enters like knowingly, these relationships are impossible. And until unless people start in their own healing recovery journey to really free themselves and understand that, you're going to continue to be more wounded and more wounded and more hurt. And your pain is going to keep rising exponentially. And, you know, some people on the other side of people with BPD, they lose their lives to this pain, to this, to these cycles, to not being able to let go, to maybe in an unconscious way choosing to not deal with your own pain. So the borderline needs to deal with their pain, their adverse experience, which is much more primal usually than those with codependency because codependency and BPD are not the same thing, even though they have some overlaps, which I'll be talking more about. So make no mistake about it, whether you're ready to hear it or not yet, these relationships do not work out. And how much more of yourself can you afford to lose? And how much more anxiety, how much more stress, which affects your body as well as you emotionally and spiritually, how much more of this can you possibly take and think that you can change it or that you're going to get the reciprocation that you're seeking, the mutuality and the reciprocity? Because the beginning of the relationship, the idealization phase, where the person with BPD draws in codependence because you think you're being so seen and so heard, and it's a wonderful experience. The siren song of way, good, way too good to be true, that inevitably, sooner or later, the honeymoon phase, if you even get one, the devaluation split comes, and the pain starts, and the cycles start. And please, if you haven't listened to the episode about the seven... Uh, the cycle of BPD relationship cycles, the seven stages, please do because you need to find a way to break free relationship dynamics. And it's sad and tragic in so many cases because I'm not here to say that borderlines are horrible people. They're just really, really damaged and they need to go and get years of treatment to change that so that they can find out who they are so that they can learn how to relate to self to relate to other. And people with codependency in a different way, not to the same degree, need to learn how to have a healthier relationship to and with yourself so that you can also work your way to healing codependency to go forward in your life in an independent way rather than a codependent way. Take care. You've been listening to the Surviving BPD Relationship Breakups podcast with counselor and trauma recovery coach, A.J. Mahari, keeping it real to help you heal. You can find this podcast website with blogs and more information and purchase and book sessions with A.J. Mahari at ajmahari.ca to help you with your healing and recovery journey from any relationship type with somebody with borderline personality. Please also check AJ's other website, bpdbreakups.com, for blog posts and more information. Please keep tuning in, and if you're not subscribed to AJ Mahari's YouTube channel, please check it out at youtube.com slash AJ Mahari.